Well, happy Father's Day once again. I know that um, Jim's greeted you, uh, and that was, that was nice. I didn't know my son was going to tell a joke, but I enjoyed that one. He knows I like to golf every once in a while. So it's a great day. Uh, nice day outside, a little chilly, um, but again, it's Rochester, so you never know. Even when the sun's out, sometimes um, it can be a little cold and up here in the Northeast. But next week, not to jump ahead too far, but I'm looking forward to the opportunity to be outside, Lord willing. And I know Dave wanted to be baptized, water baptized outside, and just so happened we're doing our open air service across the town in Parrington next week at 6 p.m. Of course, you're invited to that as well. And we planned on doing an outdoor baptism if anybody wants to next week. So it was just perfect timing. And uh, someone once told me, as a longtime phys ed p teacher back in 2002, my first field day that I organized and ran at Good Shepherd School, they said, improvise, adapt, and overcome. And I've used that in all facets of life from this time forward. I guess it's a military term, and I love it. So next week, just be ready to improvise, adapt, and overcome if things don't work out the way maybe we expected. God's in control. So let's pray. And then we'll get into the message, which will be a topical one, which I normally don't do, but today I just felt this is where I was being led to prepare. And so I've called this message the footsteps of a father, being that it's Father's Day. So please join me in a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in your house. We pray for all those gathering today, not just in uh, the assembly of brick and mortar, but also those under trees across the world or those underground uh, perhaps in uh, Iraq or North Korea, Father. We, we pray for all the church, the universal body of Christ across this world today. Many don't have a day they call Father's Day, but we have every day as Father's Day in terms of an everlasting Father. We thank you for that covenant relationship. Lord, we pray that you'd be glorified in the preaching and teaching of your word today. We ask this all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Spencerport Bible Church said, Amen. I want to just give a brief, brief introduction. Father's Day, sometimes it doesn't have the weight of Mother's Day, if we're honest. Right? Mother's Day is everybody, mothers, they have roses and flowers, and, and they should. They're so valuable, and they're so important. But sometimes fathers, we... We're guilty. We're our own worst enemy. You're like, ah, yeah, whatever. It's fine. Just, yeah, just let me hang out and watch TV today. But it really shouldn't be that way. The Bible says, give honor where honor is due. And the reality is this. The man, the father, is to many the visible image of God. You are the visible image of God to your family. Don't misconstrue that, okay? Elders especially. I'm not saying you're God, you know that. What I'm saying is, especially to those who know not God, know not Jesus, you are the image of God. God, if Jesus Christ came in the form of a man, we all agree with that, correct? And so that's a very, very, very important thing. You know, I was on briefly on social media today because, again, I've told you in the past, I go to my office in High Falls and prepare last-minute talk, on and so forth, and... I put a short social media po post out about Father's Day and the open air service next week. And I saw a gentleman that I know, and he, he wished, he said, Happy Parent Day to my mother and also her acting as a father. And can I just tell you, that's not possible. It's not possible for a mother to be a father the same way it's not possible for a father to be a mother. It's just not possible. And I don't say that to make you feel bad or to condemn you or for any other reason other than it's just the truth. I can't replace my wife. It's just not possible. God didn't make me a mother. I can't carry the seed of a child in me. I don't care what society's trying to do. It's not possible. I can't nurture the way my wife does our children. I just can't. Maybe at spots and times, but I can't in general. And she can't be me. She doesn't have the same voice as me. She doesn't look like me. She can't grow a beard, thank God. She can't replace me. Just my presence. And so today, I want to speak to you as a father. 
I want to speak to you as a father, and I want to speak to you. The reason that I made this topical is as I was praying and thinking about how to bring this across, I just want to talk about footsteps that I've walked in. And footsteps, now in 2022, we have digital footsteps. That's where if you post something, you need to be careful because there's going to be an impression there. It's going to be there. In fact, people don't get jobs now because of their digital footprints. So be careful of that. But we all know what a footprint is. If I take a step in the snow or the mud, there's going to be a, a, an impression of my shoe, of my foot. And that's what I pray the Word of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit, bring some impressions to you today about the footsteps of a father. And if you're not a father, that's okay. God will still minister to you through His Word. Seven footsteps I have. Seven footsteps. The first footstep, the footstep of lifestyle. The footstep of lifestyle. Deuteronomy chapter 6. And there's going to be a lot of flipping and you don't necessarily have to do that. But Deuteronomy chapter 6. The Shema of Israel. Verse 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them upon the posts of thy house and on your gates. This was an instruction given to Israel, given to the people, certainly knowing that the fathers, the males, were definitely honored and reverenced in those times. Maybe not so much our time in our culture, but it still is in other cultures. But speaking to the people... And speaking to the tip of the spear, so to speak, that's the father, the head of the home, as I know both Lee and myself have talked to you about 1 Timothy in chapter 3, the qualifications of a church leader, having their home in order, their children in subjection with all gravity. This instruction is given, and the heart of it, certainly we all fall short at times, but the heart of the passage is having God as the center of all your life. When you rise up, when you walk, when you're at the dinner table, teaching them, and whenever I see that word, when I read this passage diligently, it's, it's, it's convicting for me. Because diligently is steadfastly, consistently teaching the Word of God, teaching the commandments of God. You know, part of the reason we're in this, what we'll say, mess, so to speak, in this country and in our culture is because the commandments of God have been taken away. And I don't say this to embarrass you right now, but here's the thing. As seasoned Christians, if I asked you what the Ten Commandments were, my guess would be this. You probably wouldn't be able to name all ten, and certainly wouldn't be able to name all ten in order. Now, I'm not saying that to embarrass you. I had to be deliberate in memorizing those. Well, why so? Because I know that it's, the law is so important to lead people to Christ. For them to have knowledge of sin. To realize they fall short. To say, well, how did we get in the situation? When is the last time you've heard the Ten Commandments taught in a public setting, a school, or posted someplace publicly? And if it's not, people can't see their condition. And so the heart here is, whenever you walk by the way, when you rise up first thing in the morning, seek first the kingdom, when you lie down before you go to bed at night, my word, my law, to lamp unto your feet, a light unto your path. Job says, I value your word more than my own food. Can we say that? This is the heart of the Shema. Teach your children diligently. And let me tell you, it's very, very easy in this society, in this, and I've been guilty of it many times, more than I'd like to admit, of just letting the Word of God fall by the wayside in your home. It just falls by the wayside. Now, you could post it in the house, and that's beautiful, and you should. You can have it in the bathroom. We have many Bibles and Scripture and things in our home. 
But to actually gather them together, gather together your family and teach them the word of God. Just read them. You say, I don't know how to teach. Just read scripture then. You know, my sons and I, especially my, my younger ones, so to speak, once in a while I'll say, do you want to do a, a Proverbs read? And we'll just alternate verses as we read it. Now, I don't do that as diligently as I should, but we've done that over the years. Or the other night, I had them all, I had a captive audience. All the kids were there. Dom, my, my Bria's boyfriend was there. We had a, another like adopted daughter of mine there. They're all a captive audience. So I'm like, okay, here it is. Here's the time. I said, I just, everybody stay at the dinner table. I had an opportunity to share what God had given me through his word to give to them. It doesn't have to be religious, so to speak, but it should be the heart of your life, the center of your life. That's the footstep. That's one footstep as fathers we should walk in. It should be one impression. Second footstep in Job, the footstep of sacrifice as a father, the footstep of sacrifice. Job chapter 1, this to me probably is the most, most challenging, convicting single verse in the entire Bible for me as a father. Every time I read it, I shrink. Let me read the first few verses of Job chapter 1, then we'll pause at the fifth. It says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, one that feared God and shunned evil. He eschewed evil. There were born unto him seven daughters, or I'm sorry, seven sons and three daughters, so he had ten children. Verse 3, His substance also was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she asses, and a very great household. So this, this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. Now here's the verse. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about, that's their, his ten children, that Job sent and sanctified them, and he rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. That's ten individual burnt offerings offered up in the morning, early, for each one of his children, for Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. And I read that, and I think, wow. What would that look like in New Testament era? What would look, at the very minimum, it's daily prayers. Daily prayers as a father for your children. At least mentioning your children in your prayers, thinking of them even at times fasting for them. That would be maybe like a burnt offering. No, we're not going to take a, a, a goat or a bull or a sheep or whatever animal, a pigeon, and put it on the altar and slip. But this is what he did. This is what Job did in the Old Testament. Of course, he didn't have Netflix and Hulu and all this stuff to distract him. I mean, this is what they did. They lived off the land. They were dedicated to the things of God. And every morning early, like Jesus did when he went into a solitary place, Job would seek God on behalf of ten children and individually offer ten sacrifices. And that blows me away. And as a father, I could just say, one footprint will be, pray for my child, my children daily. Make that sacrifice to some extent. Continually pray for them. Seek God for them. Now this third footstep is going to be a little bit more difficult to swallow for some of you. But it's inevitable. I'm going to tell you this. It's inevitable. And if you're a father, you're going to be able to relate to this. It's the footstep of failure and heartache. And I'm not going to tell you to flip around for this because I have a few examples. But 1 Samuel, the priest Eli, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12 says this. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial, they knew not the Lord. Eli, we know, was the priest. Samuel was brought to him at a very young age, mentored in the temple. But Eli's sons, Ophni and Phinehas, they were hell raisers, literally sleeping with prostitutes in the temple. What heartache. You know, everybody always talks about Eli must not have had his home in order. Does anybody think about the pain he must have felt? 
Does anybody ever think about the heartache that he must have felt? We don't know why that happened. We really don't. We don't hear about his wife. We don't, hear, we don't know, but if I've often told my wife this, I am really good, and I'm going to include you in it, you are really good at judging poorly. And if you're honest, you'll agree with that. We don't know why, but we know that there's great failure taken upon the shoulders of Eli in terms of his son, sons, Hophni and Phinehas. How about Samuel, his spiritual son? He grows up, listen to this. His sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre, or money, took bribes and perverted judgment. I mean, this, is, this was the little one that Hannah prayed for that, that Eli sees, and she, he thinks she's drunk, and no, she's just crying out to the Lord, there's no words, and she makes a covenant promise to God, I will dedicate him to you, keeps it. Brings Samuel to Eli, he grows up, has Eli as a great spiritual father, he has sons, and now he has also hell raisers. What's, why? I don't know. Well, again, we assume, so well, he, too much time in the temple, this, that. We don't really know that. One thing we know is he felt failure and he felt heartache. And every father experiences that. Failure and heartache on the behalf of your children. You despise the shame. But what would Jesus do? He came to heal the brokenhearted. And some of you in here today, you can relate to this. You've walked in these shoes. You've taken this footstep. How about Aaron, his sons, Nadab and Abihu, going to the temple drunk, offer up straight fire, struck down, and you know what God says to Moses? Carry their bodies outside the temple and hold your peace. Say nothing. How would you like to be in that boat? Your sons are literally struck down on the altar, and you could say nothing about it because it was just in the eyes of God. How about David? How about King David? Solomon goes after strange women when he's told not to. Ruins his legacy. Absalom goes against his own father's kingdom. What did those fathers all have in common without judging, without knowing much? They experienced failure and heartache. And as a father, you will walk in those footsteps at some point in time. It's inevitable. The next footstep, the footstep of counsel and warning. First Corinthians, this is the Apostle Paul. Now the Apostle Paul, because I know many of you are Bible students, he was a member of the Sanhedrin, he was schooled under Gamaliel. This man was a Pharisee of Pharisees, born the eighth day, tribe of Benjamin, circumcised of the eighth day, I should say. Oh, to be part of the Sanhedrin, you had to be married. We, we don't know if he had children per se, I don't know what the theologians have said. Probably, my guess would be, if you need to really find out, Tom may have the answer to this. So I know Tom is quite the Bible teacher and student. But we know this. He had spiritual sons. He had spiritual sons in Timothy and Titus. He said in Titus chapter 1, verse 4, to Titus, my own son after the common faith. My son Timothy, he'll remind you of me. I have no one else like him. It says in 1 Corinthians 4, 14, I write not these things to shame you. He's talking to the Corinthian church, his spiritual children. But as beloved sons, I warn you. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. Son, daughter, remember? Remember, I was the one who cried with you. I was the one who was with you during that difficult time. I was the one who brought you into Christ. And as fathers, sometimes you have to give counsel or warnings or reminders. I'm just going to tell you this, son. You don't have to listen to me. And, and when your kids get old enough, like many of mine are headed toward that counseling age, I will say, this is what I'm going to tell you, son. You don't have to listen to me because I can't make you really listen to me at 16, 17, 20, 25. But here's what I'm going to give you the counsel. And whether or not they listen to it, it's between them and God. I'm not going to spank my 16-year-old, okay? We're beyond that. I'm not going to spank a 25-year-old young man. 
And Paul the Apostle can relate to this, at least in a spiritual connotation, that these Corinthians, the same ones that were brought into the Gospel through him, are accusing him of not even being an apostle or not even having a legitimate ministry. Counsel, warning. A reminder that you were the one that sweat, bled, invested in their life. You know, a, a wise man, in fact, I parked next to him yesterday. I was going to say it to him, and I didn't. He'll never know this. this. This man named Jeremy, Jeremy Glidden, he said something to me, just rang into my ears. And it's so true, so simple, yet so profound. He has five children. I think his oldest is about to get married. She's, only, she's like 19 or 20. He's got five, I got six. He's like, you know, one thing I'll never have to worry about is having too much money. I can I absolutely relate to that. I, I, you, know, you know why? Because most of my money just goes toward my children. And that's okay. That's okay. But sometimes you have to remind them, hey, did you know that uh, who's the one that's paying for this, that, the other? Who's the one that's working so that you can do this or that? And that's what the Apostle Paul's doing. He's saying, are you my enemy because I'm telling you the truth? I don't want to shame you, son. I just want to warn you. The next footstep, the footstep of modeling. Same passage. 1 Corinthians 4, 17. The same passage in 1 Corinthians 4, 17. As I read already, it says, my son Timothy. Again, this is not his biological son. He didn't come from his loins. In fact, guess what? Timothy, it seems as though his father wasn't around. It was Lois and Eunice, his mother and grandmother, that raised him and trained him up in the Holy Scriptures. And that's what a mother has to do if the father's not there. But understand this, they can never be a father. And that's where men come in like the Apostle Paul and they take up that mantle of fathers. I told you, we had a young lady with us that I will call my daughter, will consider her my daughter. Why? Because her dad's a deadbeat. And I know that that's a coarse term, but I say that with passion. And I say that, you know, the Apostle Paul, I just read it this morning. You know what he said to Galatians? Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you from obeying the truth? Sometimes you need to hear a hard word. And the Bible says this, if you don't take care of your family, and that's more than just financial, you're worse than an infidel or unbeliever. And, and, and fathers are lacking terribly in this country and the next. Spiritual fathers, biological fathers. If you're looking for something to do ministry-wise, I'll give you some ideas. Go seek out a young man who doesn't have a father and become like the Apostle Paul was to Timothy or Titus. Do that. There was a young man at uh, the school this year that I was at. And I happen to have this young man in my, uh, one of my elective classes. And this class allowed me to have more interaction than most. And through that, and through some other curriculum that I developed, we did some public speaking, and this young man has a father, but he's extremely uninvolved. He's really not. He struggles with drugs and alcohol, and he's wasn't even at his graduation party, if that gives you an idea. But what I saw by investing some time into this young man and loving on him a bit and giving to him a bit and listening to him and affirming him, all of a sudden, there's this father-son thing going on. Because that's how God intended it. That's how God intended it to be. And you can't replace a father. You just can't. That's the bad news today. But the good news is, anyone who is a male, and, and let's get this straight. I know I'm preaching to the choir here. But let's get this straight. There's male, there's female, there's nothing in between. I am not going to call you they, whom, she. I'm not going to do that, because that's a lie. There's male, made in the image of God. And then there's female, taken from the rib as a helper. That's it. Can't switch them. Can't flip-flop them. I don't care how you dress. 
I don't care what you say your name is. That's how it is in God's economy and God's word. And it says his truth endures to all generations. That means past, present, future. I am God, I change not. We change, not him. And so this example of modeling You start to become, you know, I will go, my son, my oldest son, who now works here locally part-time, it's the funniest thing because I'll pull up to pick him up. He doesn't like me to come until exactly the time for whatever reason, but I sit in my van and I watch him walk and I really laugh sometimes. He walks like me. And I have a distinct walk, I've realized that. At least my wife tells me that. But he walks like me, and I watch him. It's funny to me, because I'm like, that is kind of a funny walk that he has. But it's mine. How does that happen? It happens from 16 years of just being around your father. You start to walk like him. You start to talk like him. You start to act like him. How many of you can say, if you're a woman, you're just like your mother? Or you've heard that before. Raise your hand if you've heard that before. You're just like your mother at least once. A couple, thank you, hands are going up. I mean, that's how God designed it. Jesus said, follow me to his 12 disciples. Paul the Apostle said, follow me as I follow Christ. God always intended you to be like those you're around. Two more steps. This is a tough one, the the sixth one, the footstep of suffering. You will suffer as a parent. You will suffer. No one likes suffering. Christ didn't like suffering in the garden. Can this cup pass from me? It's not naturally human to like suffering. It's supernatural to endure suffering. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15, once again, the Apostle Paul, and I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I'm loved. Can you, can you relate to that as a parent? I give you everything. You hate me. I love you. You seem to hate me. I give you counsel. You give me attitude. I, this, this is the Apostle Paul's. Every parent can relate to you. I mean, every, every parent can relate to the Apostle Paul. What he's saying to his spiritual sons and daughters in Corinth, you you can relate to this. You have to endure that cup of suffering. Raise your hand if you have a perfect child and they've never caused you to suffer. Not one hand. I I don't even have to look. I can be blindfolded. I know no hands are going to go up. And it's not like this. It's not like, all right, when they turn 18, I'm a free man. doesn't work like that, does it? I mean, I, I know of stories of people who have They have children in their 30s, 40s, even 50s, and they're still suffering because of their grown children. That doesn't change they're your children. Last one. The footstep of covenant relationship. The footstep of covenant relationship. Isaiah Chapter 9, verse 6, we love this verse at Christmas time, don't we? But how about this title, Everlasting Father? How many times, like that young man I told you about earlier, I I can look at a young man and say he doesn't have a father. You can see it in their eyes. You can see it in their countenance. You can see it in the way they carry themselves. Sometimes there's a sadness there. There's an anger there. There's a void there. But with, but with God, one of his most, the, one of the most beautiful covenant terms is everlasting Father. And whether you like it or not, if your seed is responsible for bearing a child, you have that lasting covenant until you pass on. But we know our God will never. Leave you, he says, I will never forsake you. I'll never abandon you. So many times I've used used that verse to comfort fatherless people. He's a father to the fatherless. That's why his heart is for widows. They've lost their covering and orphans. They don't have their covering. They've both lost it.
I'll take these last few minutes to end with this, scripture-wise. If there's one verse I've discovered, experientially speaking, in my fathering experience that I will pass along and that I have walked in and I probably, I inevitably will continue to walk in and I pray um, we take this to heart. It's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. It says this, looking unto Jesus, that's what fathers must do. You must look unto Jesus. The author and finisher of our faith, he started the work, he will finish it, he has finished it, at Calvary, who for the joy set before him, that's the final destination, endured the cross. That means you go through it, you persevere it, love endures all things, you endure the cross, the instrument of death, the thing that pains you, despising the shame like Christ did, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The cross, enduring the shame, will bring forth rest as you look unto Jesus as a father. Joy, a cross, no. But Christ had his eyes set on the final destination, being restored with the Father as he was carrying his instrument of death that he would ultimately be nailed on. As people were spitting and railing and he was suffering, the joy was that once he endured this, he'd come back into restoration with his Father and be seated next to him. And as you suffer as a father, as you despise the shame at times that your children may bring to you, as you endure the, the, the sacrifice and the sufferings, you keep your eyes on Jesus, you look to Jesus who gave you these children and will finish the work and then you will have rest as they inherit the kingdom of heaven, God willing. And if they don't, you've done your part. You've done your part. God has no grandchildren, we know that. We can't save anybody, we know that. The work of God. But you are the conduit. You are ordained, chosen of God as a father to lead, whether you like it or not. And there's many times, if you're a father, you, if you're honest, you don't want to lead, you don't know how to lead, you don't lead well, because you're the tip of that spear. And when the tip is dull, there's no direction. You guide you make the final decisions, and you do it in a way that Christ would. Not a dictator. You're not a jerk. You lead the way Christ would have you to lead. In Jesus' name. So here's what I like to do, and I always ask permission for this, the elders, and, and I really enjoyed the beginning of the service, that's a nice way to, it's a nice thing to do on Father's Day, right? Laughter is medicine to the bones, and you bless people, bless the fathers. I'm going to ask if you would be so kind, because it's such a serious thing, needing help myself with such a large family, three boys, three girls, my wife, I've often said, every decision I make affects at least seven other people. Every decision I make. I mean, really, even if I, if I play golf, that's going to affect seven in some way, shape, or form. So what I'd like to do is just ask, if you are a father, biologically in this case, but I know there's probably spiritual fathers in here as well, but if you have a child, a, a son or a daughter, if you'd be so kind to just please stand up, if you'd stand, please, if you're a father, Thank you, Barry. I know there's more than Barry. If you just stand, please. Don't be afraid to be acknowledged. You see, that's part of the problem with fathers these days. Like, oh, I don't want it. No, you need to be honored today, according to God's word. You need to be charged today. According, you know what Paul did to Timothy? He says, I charge you, my son. And today, God charges you 
as fathers, you and I, to do what we've been called to do according to God's word, today's the day. I'll remind you, I'll echo the words of the Apostle Paul that was read. Although you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, you have not many fathers. You know what that means? It means there's only one that will have that blood, sweat, and tears. Only one person. And you can be that person today. You've made mistakes as a father, just like me. You've been a father many more years than me. But you can learn from one another. You can pray for one another. You can encourage one another. You can inf- affirm one another. You have no idea. I have no idea sometimes. One thing you might say to somebody. I'm going to finish with this. Please, if you could stay standing for one more minute. I was at the Open Door Mission Friday night, and this testimony rocked me. I had a young man come up. His name's Sasha. He's half my age. He's 23 years old. I never heard his testimony. Comes up, he says, I'm, I was born in Russia. I lost my father at four years old. I said, I never knew my father. He says, uh, I was working at McDonald's down in Alabama, sleeping in my car. I went to this ministry, eventually he received Christ. Before he received Christ, he said, God, he said, uh, so I've never had a father. So I've never been affirmed. I've never been told I love you. He said, if you could just do that for me, I'll know. The next Sunday, he's in a church. It's the random guy. Walks up to him. Says, son, I love you. Puts his arm around him. Went out the door. The guy never, he never saw the guy again. Is that God? It's God. That's God. He'll affirm you. He'll love you. For God demonstrated his love toward us while we're sinners. Christ died for us. I just want to pray over you and then my wife, and you can thank the, the good men of Spencer Board Bible who agreed with this. Just a, a gift card for you, remain standing after. I just want to pray a charge over you. And then lastly, you could just distribute those cards to those that are standing. If you're online and you're a father and you feel slighted, don't. Just call the office. They'll get you one. Barry told me that. So let's, I just want to pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for each man right now that's standing. Lord, to be a father is to be the image bearer of Christ. As Jesus told his disciple, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Lord, we were made in your image. Father, help us. Help us as examples to our children and those around us to be what the Word of God intends us to be to not provoke our children to anger, to to raise them up in the nurture and their admonition of the Lord, to teach them diligently as we walk by the way or as we lie down, to despise the shame, to endure the cross of fathering, Lord, to ultimately bring you glory. I pray over each man right now here standing and even those that are seated. Father, raise up. Raise up fathers. Raise them up. Keep them strong for your glory and your honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Les, if you could just pass those gift cards around to the ones that are standing. Again, I want to say thank you to the three elders, or like the three wise men, I guess. Tom, Barry, and Jim. Uh, You know, I've been teaching here. I'll be here again next week. You know, there's things I'm praying about, so on and so forth. They're really nice men. There have been fathers to this church from what I've seen. And uh, make sure you say thank you to them. They don't have to do this. I don't, think anyone's, I don't think any of them are on payroll that I know. So why do they do it? Just do it because they love the Lord and they love you. And they want to serve you. So thank you, Tom, Barry, Jim, everybody who serves, everyone back there in the AV. Um, it's a family thing, family of God. And it goes beyond SBC. Every church today that claims the name of Christ and knows him, 
and wants to make him known, is born again, believes in the Lord, the inerrancy of his word, so on and so forth, part of the family of God. God bless you. Be blessed today, fathers and mothers and the entirety of the family of God. In Jesus' name, have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.